is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Arun Jodakin all the way from Jerusalem, Israel. He is an expert in the fields of tooth structure, dental materials, and tooth restoration interfaces. His pioneering research at the molecular level has been recognized and achieved awards, including the Elida Gibbs Research Award, the Colgate Palmolive Prize, and the Wiseman Institute of Reshoff Memorial Prize. Dr. Jodakin received his dental degree and BDS and MS Master's in Science degrees from the University of Witzerutzen, South Africa, and thereafter his basic science PhD from the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel. He has lectured at various universities and institutes at undergraduate and postgraduate levels and maintains a dental practice while advancing his research, which is focused on preventative dentistry and oral health. In fact, his clinical awareness of the lack of effective prevention between teeth gave rise to the focal concept, which he patented and developed. His publications, numbering more than 25, have been published in peer-reviewed journals, and he has developed patents, including those of the focal series designed to prevent interproximal caries. My gosh, Arun, you might be the smartest man I've ever podcast interviewed before. I hope I'm smart I, enough to a- ask the right questions. But let's just start is start with what is the focal concept? Okay, the original idea started from my clinical experience, just doing interproximal restorations. Two things bothered me. First of all, it's time consuming. The second thing is that you have to re- re- remove for access incredible amount of healthy tooth tissue, and it it involves a lot of pain and unnecessary suffering. So my original idea was to develop something that would at least do good in terms of preventing interproximal decay. So fluoride was the big hope, but it failed in terms of interproximal decay, primarily because the uh, fluoride is not targeted, and there's a concept called the isocap. This someone developed, or the theory, and I think it's true, was an American from Ann Arbor whose name is O'Brien. You probably might have known, heard of his name. He developed the idea, and, and I think it's very solid, that when you have two pieces of glass with a little bit of water between them, they create a negative pressure, and it's very hard to access that area. So just like a a drop of water between two pieces of um, slide glasses, the same applies between two teeth, and you develop what's called an isocap. It's an isolated negative pressure area, and fluoride, for example, a rinse or even toothpaste, doesn't get there so easily. So my idea of the focal was we had to break that isocap and put the fluoride right there between the teeth and have it there long enough to fluoridate the area to prevent and maybe reverse incipient decay. That's basically the focal idea. It's a basically a little disc fits between the teeth. It slowly dissolves, releasing fluoride, and there are other substances there as well to incre- encourage or enhance remineralization. I love on your website, focal fluoride disc. What in the folk is focal? <laughs> The name is oh so clever. The way it changes up the F sound, pinpoints the precision of its delivery mechanism, adds in a little calcium and acid base interplay there, plus a little disc sort of kind of looks like contact lenses, focal, the latest in fluoride therapy. So what is your, how are these to be used? The key to it is to diagnose um, the cases where it's going to be effective. And the best um, situation is when you can reach it in the initial stages or where you can predict that there's a very high chance of decay starting in that particular area. It's based on uh, the stats showing the, pre- the incidence and the prevalence of, of decay between teeth. We can speak about that later. But basically, once a dentist has decided, or even the oral hygienist has decided, this is a site that needs to be treated, the disc is removed from the packaging, and it's simply pushed or placed between the teeth. Often, especially in posterior teeth, you have to separate the teeth, so you need to apply a wedge. You can do to prevent unnecessary pain, you can put the wedge, especially a wooden wedge, in a little bit of liquid um, topical anesthetic material, and then you wedge it in slowly, and the space increases, and then it's much easier to position. Normally, it's very, very difficult to position in the interproximal area in posterior teeth. 
But with a wedge, it can, it can be done. So um, a very confusing thing around the world last year was when media companies were saying that there is zero evidence on flossing and uh, everybody was saying, oh, well, I didn't floss to begin with. And now the New York Times is telling me that there's no research to even prove that it works. So, hell, now I'm never going to floss. What, what are your thoughts on flossing? I think the first of all, I don't think the studies were 100% accurate. The, first of all, flossing has to be effectively done. Just simply slipping the floss between the teeth is not going to do it because a lot of decay is below the contact area of the teeth. It's b so you need to, f you, you have to pl floss correctly for it to be effective. I believe that if someone does brush and floss, floss and brush is better. If they do so, then I think the, the chances of decay are much lower. But it has to be done properly. I don't know if the average person does floss effectively. That's maybe a failing of the dental profession and maybe even the commercial world. But that's my take of it. So when did you start selling these? These came on the market. We first produced them in Switzerland, and then it was introduced. Um, and then afterwards, the commercial people's changed to an American firm that's that's producing it. So about a year ago, or a little bit maybe less, it hit the market. And um, the, from the in terms of the financial or the commercial area, I'm not so familiar. With it. I, I was primarily involved with the science and developing the concept, but from a commercial and a financial point of view, I'm, I'm not so clued up. Are, are you the sole owner or did you did you sell your technology? No, well, there's, there's shares. I have some royalties and a few little shares here and there, but that's basically my whole in, in terms of the company. Do you? But I'm, I'm not involved in the, in the directorship or anything. I'm just involved in the science. Well, you know, on Dentaltown, we um, started an online continuing education program We've put up 411 courses, and they're coming up on a million views. This might be something where if you um, created an hour-long course, an online CE course, maybe if they saw videos, pictures, uh, all that, you might um, uh, explain your concept easier. Would you be willing or interested in making an online CE course showing yes. clinical cases? Yes, we could do that. I'm Howard at Dentaltown.com. Um, the guy that does the online CE is Howard Goldstein. So he, so since I was already Howard at Dentaltown.com, he's a Hogo, H-O-G-O. -O. He goes by Hogo since we already had a Howard. But if you email Hogo, H-O-G-O, -O, at Dentaltown.com, I, I personally would love to see an online CE um, course that. I want, to, I want to go off into completely left field. It contains 0 0.1135 milligrams of sodium fluoride uh, per disc. Um, what's really weird in the United States, I don't know if it's the same in Israel, but about a quarter of Americans think fluoridated water is a communist plot, a conspiracy. It makes tea soft so that they break down, so they need expensive dentistry. Do you... Um, what are your thoughts? And, and now I notice some of the younger millennial dentists are actually buying into this and uh, are against water fluoridation. Does Jerusalem or Israel have community water fluoridation? And what is your thoughts on water fluoridation and its effectiveness of preventing uh, tooth decay? Well, is, first of all, Israel does have it, but there was a stage where there was a different governmental uh, control and then someone that was, was an anti-fluoridationist took it off and came back on. It sort of swung back and forth based on the political um, show, especially in terms of Jerusalem. I, I'm pro-fluoride, but I, I don't believe that it should be used to the extent that it is used. It has to be used effectively. In other words, it should be targeted. You can't just apply fluoride everywhere and hope that it reaches its um, destined site. You have to put it where it needs to be placed and you have to put it in the right concentration and not to overuse it and on the other hand and not to and not and not to fail to take advantage of its benefits. That's basically my But are you are you for water fluoridation in Jerusalem or do you think it's um No, I, I'm for it. You're you're for it? 
Yeah. And have you seen good research that when they were ta- when they were taking it out of the water in Jerusalem, did pediatric decay go up? When they put it back in, did it go down? Were there, were there any great measurements or insights of data? I don't think it was good enough data. And first of all, it was only for two years that, that it was taken off. So I'd, I'm not sure if you would pick up such a change so easily unless you did an, an incredibly extensive study, which wasn't done from my according to my knowledge. And, and what, what um, toothpaste do you recommend? Well, I mean, I would just think that you would just know a lot about fluoride, uh, sodium fluoride. Do, do you, is there, um, do, you, do you recommend, because there are hygienists in America that um, follow dry brushing, and they say that, you know, to remove plaque, you need a really nice soft bristle toothpaste with, with, I mean, soft bristle toothbrush with very straight bristles, and that if you brush for two minutes dry, that you effectively remove the the plaque um, just the same, and that the toothpaste is uh, not really um, relevant. From the research point of view, I think toothpaste decreased um, decay by about twenty percent. Um, it has its limitations because uh, it didn't. For example, in the States, many years ago, they, they were so encouraged by the effectiveness of fluoride that they actually started closing dental schools. I remember Northwestern was closed because of that, because they predicted that there would be an incredible um, change in dentistry because of fluoride. But that didn't, didn't come about because I think fluoride has its limitations. You can't expect it to work everywhere if it's not getting there, first of all, and you also have to be careful not to overuse it. Um, untargeted fluoride, like I said, I, I, I think that's, that's a pity because you don't need to do that type of thing. Yeah, they closed down seven dental schools. I don't remember all the names, but it was Northwestern, Georgetown, Farley Dickerson, Emory, and, uh, God, it was 30 years ago. I don't remember the other three, but it was actually seven of them closed down. Right. Yeah, because Northwestern was a very good university that was a pity in a way from a research point of view. But anyway, yeah. So, um, so what what else um what else do they need to know about a uh, focal therapy, a focal um, interproximal therapy? Um, I think the most important thing is that there, there are two things. Dentists are in the habit of just filling and drilling, and you get into that mindset, and then it's very hard to get out of it. So I don't think it's going to be used so easily because dentists, and I know for myself, because of habit, and I think also there, there's, although we speak about fluoride so much in prevention, most dentists just, once they're in the working chair, they, they don't get there. I think, this is my take of it, I don't know, it might be wrong. In the, in the, the human brain is divided into two parts from the two hemispheres, and the one, the one deals with uh, speech and logic and that's where I think we speak about prevention and we we encourage it and we think it's right and then the the opposite side deals with spatial uh, factors and that's where the dentist when he's sitting in the chair is dealing mainly with spatial um, parameters and I think that sets his mind in a s- stage where he, he, he sort of doesn't think of prevention so something's going to have to change if we're going to move into prevention, especially regarding dentists that are involved in filling all the time. That's the first thing. The second thing is that dentists are going to have to understand the research data. For I'll give a few examples in terms of uh, the prevalence and incidence of decay and the statistics. They're going to have to understand where the decay occurs. For example, we took data from, from NIH beautiful study by one but it's 30 years old and we there's there, there's never been a study that is close to the study and we translated the statistical data i have it here for example you could see it here the percentages of decay between teeth so it ranges for example in some cases close to 40 percent in molars and for example in the bottom teeth the, the average american is around about two percent so the first thing is the dentist is going to have to change his mindset and understand where is the prevalence and the incidence of decay. That's the first thing. Well, the on, second on, thing, on, well on that, is the upper teeth and the lower teeth, is it the same percentage going around? Very similar except for the, ta- the anterior teeth. Well, well let's start. Okay, let's, let's go through those numbers. Um, between second and first molar, what's the percent? 
It's around about 40%. 40% what? End up having an interproximal lesion? 40% of Americans will have either a lesion or there, there would have been an extraction or there, there would be a restoration in those positions. By what age? This is the average. This is the uh, it, it, but, gets, but is gets it, high. Is that for their entire lifetime or just? This, this was a study that took uh, a range of ages, and that's the average in terms of age and population, different groups, racial groups or whatever. Did, did you have a number between the wisdom tooth and the second molar? No, they don't have data on them. Okay, they so, didn't have so no data there. So between the second molar and the first molar is 40%. What about first molar and right. second by? That's the the molar has around about forty percent, and the bicuspid is around about thirty percent. And then keep, both on the and then keep the similar. And then that same for first bicuspid. Then it goes down. Uh, first bicuspid and second one is around about seventeen percent. Okay. For both sides. And then uh, what about um, between first bicuspid and canine? That's also seventeen percent. And on the uppers, it's slightly lower. It's 13% for some reason. I'm not sure why. And then that's between the canine and the lateral? The canine and lateral on the lower is around about 4%. And on, on the uh, um, upper teeth, it's around about 12%. Huh, interesting. I still can't figure out why they named a canine tooth after a dog. <laughs> Did you ever figure that out in your research? No, I didn't. Did you <laughs> think about it? No, but you know what? That would be a great post. I I think you should start a thread, and you could if you're. I know you guys are uh, uh, shy and humble. I mean, um, um, millennials they just post away on Facebook. But I know Dennis between fifty five and seventy five. Like, like take Bob Ibsen. I couldn't get him to post on downtime because he said, "Ah, oh, that's that's." bragging or I, I don't want to draw any attention to myself, but you should start a thread on Dental Town and say, hey, I just got done on a podcast with Howard and he told me to post this chart and tell you uh, what you've done. Plus, you're a dentist. I mean, it's not like you're an MBA and a salesman trying to sell something slick. I mean, hell, you're, how many years have you been chair-side clinical dentistry? Around about 35, 40 years. Yeah, so I, I mean... so to forget these type of things, like you probably... How long have you been? <laughs> uh, 30 years. My, my dental office, which is uh, three miles up the street from my house, um, had its 30-year anniversary uh, September 11th. September 11th, um, yeah, last year, uh, 2017. I graduated in 1987, University of Missouri, Kansas City. I mean, you just have instant credibility. I mean, you're a dentist for 35, 40 years. You should start a thread on Dentaltown and post that. They're looking at everything spatial, and the first thing you wanted them to do is when they're looking at these teeth to start thinking about the chance of them getting an interproximal uh, lesion and that tooth ending up having to be extracted or a restoration, what were you going to say after that? Well, the, besides the incidence and the prevalence, the other factor is the there's a study in an English group which basically one's data shows the same thing. If you have a restoration on the left side, there's on the same symmetrical side, the opposite side, there's an 80% chance the same thing's going to happen over there. So there you have a classic case. If you just placed an MOD or MO or DO, on the opposite side, there's an 80% chance, if there isn't a restoration there already, that you're going to have decay. So that's an ideal spot. Amazing concept. But yeah, they, they taught us that 30 years ago, that if you're not quite sure... If this tooth is gonna, has an interproximal lesion, look on the other side of the tooth. If, if there's and, and, and just start doing this, kids, when you're when you're looking at a patient, when you're looking at someone my age, 55 years old, start noticing on the on the pano, the FMX, and looking in the mouth that the right side pretty much mimics the left side. And and I'll tell you, so many times, like like um, they'll have uh, and where it comes in effect, maybe they have a bridge replacing a first molar on the left side. And now you, they have a toothache on the, uh, that first molar on the other side, and your first thought is, well, I'm going to do a root canal and a crown. Well, then you need to start talking to the patient. Well, why is this tooth missing? Well, they did a root canal buildup and crown, and it only lasted a couple years, and then they had to extract it, and they did a bridge or an implant or a crown. Well, th that probably means this tooth has got some vertical fracture in it. 
that you might not see, but, but for diagnosing and treatment planning, looking at your contralateral side is the best damn second opinion you're ever going to get. I mean, your right hand looks like your left hand, your right foot looks like your left foot, and by the time you're 55, the right half of your mouth is going to look like the left half of the mouth. And you say you have a study you can reference on that, and I would love um, to, uh, to read that and post that on Dentaltown. Or, or you can post it when you start your photo there. You, you can post that JPEG of, that you held up. Um, do you have that on a JPEG, that, um, that incidence of decay? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could post that, the incidence I of decay. I can give it to you as well. Yeah, yeah, email it to me. Email me that, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and send me the study because that is so profound. And I know we've never talked about that on this show before. And that is, uh, you're, you're right. So the, the contralateral side has an 80% chance of looking like the other side. That's what you're saying. Right. That, that's based on research. It's, it's not, uh, and as a clinician, you get the feeling that's true. Absolutely. You have a lot of interesting case studies. And one is Dr. Berg, a pediatric case study, Dr. Parham, and Dr. Jackson, um, I wish you could get them to go on Dental Town and start posting these cases. So let's start with uh, Dr. Berg in pediatrics. Um, one of the biggest controversial things right now in the United States, um, you know, there's tons of controversy always when you start talking about occlusion, TMJ, neuromuscular headaches, all that stuff like that. But there's pretty much never been any controversy in pediatric dentistry in my 30 years until now with the advent of silver diamine fluoride. Um, there are um, pediatric dentists who say, if this kid um, needs to be put under, you know, the kid's two or three years old and you need to put him under, um, that's a very high risk procedure. And it seems like every uh, three or four months in America, some little kid is put under uh, um, by a board certified anesthesiologist to be worked on by a specialist pediatric dentist and the kid doesn't wake up. So some people are saying, just start painting the teeth with silver diamine fluoride. And uh, what, what is your, and, and then other ones are saying, no, they need to be treated. Um, what are your thoughts on silver diamine fluoride? And what are your thoughts on using the focal therapy on pediatric decay? I can tell you what, what's happening from the financial people that I do know, because it's got something to do with science. They're looking into using it in the, within the focal concept. In other words, the disc would contain the same material as what they're painting on, so in order to be more effective interproximally. Um, obviously, because it's a preventative regime, if there's no health hazards, then I'm, I'm very much for it. It's been used in Japan for a long time, so it seems to be a reasonably safe regime. For the silver diamine fluoride or for the... Um yes. Yeah, sure. So that's what we're talking about, silver diamond flora. So yeah. are you using it in your office? No, I, I, don't, I don't have any, and I'm, I'm not using it at this time, but I'm certainly thinking of it. Now, that, was on, uh, that case was Dr. Joel Berg, DDSMS, professor at University of Washington. Now, is he still there, or, did he, or is he no longer there? From my knowledge, I think he's still there, but I'm not sure. So, October 26, 2017, says the University of Washington's dental school dean has resigned and the university is looking for a raise to reduce a $36 million dental school deficit. Faced with a growing dental school deficit that now totals $36 million, the dean of the University of Washington School of Dentistry resigned. Joel Berg resigned Monday because Monday which was Monday, October 26, 1972, because he believes it will be best for the school dentistry to have fresh leadership to resolve its urgent financial challenges, wrote Provost Jerry Balsty in an email to staffers. Uh, Balsty's held an all-school meeting with dental school faculty and students. Um, so, yeah, that was a lot of turmoil. I, I've known Joel for 30 years. Um, um, had many... Uh, I actually got lucky one time. We were both... Uh, lecturing at some convention, and then we both had to fly somewhere to catch a layover for me to fly to Washington, him, me to fly to Phoenix, him fly to Washington. And I sat next to him for three hours, and I felt sorry for him because he pulled out his laptop, and I knew he wanted to get a lot of work done. And I just interviewed him like this for the whole three hours. My goal was to suck everything out of that amazing man's mind for three hours. And I could tell he was like, getting frustrated, but I just, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't say no. I just had to ask him anything. He's a world-renowned pediatric dentist, and he's doing a case for yours. Are you friends with him? 
I've never met him, and I'm not familiar with him in, in terms of uh, the, the focal concept. Um, well, Joel, if you're the, out there listening, I want you to come on the show and uh, talk about silver diamine fluoride, the focal concept, and what the hell happened at uh, the $36 million school death said, how did that happen? And uh, sorry you had to resign over that. I bet that was not a very fun time of your life. Is the market using a lot of these focal discs in pediatric kids? Or are they more adolescent and adults? Uh, who's, who's mostly the clinical cases? I'm not familiar with the uh, financial and the commercial side of things, but it certainly is appropriate for children. Um, the only one person from the States that I worked with in terms of the science was uh, for, uh, Frank Lippert in Indiana University, where they did an independent study to check the effectiveness of focal. It's an in vitro study using um, teeth in human mouths with human, no, in human saliva, using human saliva, and it was shown to be very effective. So His name was yeah, Frank what? Lippert. How do you spell that? L-I-P-P-E-R-T. Frank Lippert at Indiana? Indiana University, yes. That was an independent study. The other studies we did was, it was sort of in-house, so that hasn't been published. But this study was published. He is cariology, teaches cariology, operative dentistry, and dental public health, Indiana. Current, re, current position, associate research professor. Um, interesting. So um, now was he a colleague? Of your, how did you get Frank um, to do the research on this? I think it was an American consultant that uh, put us in contact with him, with their group. Um, Bill Cooley, I think was his name. Uh, he put us in contact with him, and they, together with him, we designed uh, the study, and they uh, conducted the study independently and published the results. Uh, they put my name on the paper as well because I helped them design the study and made the focals, I guess. Um, but it was done together. Now, tell us about your journey. When you got out of dental school, when did you start having a love with research? Did you, were you always research driven? Did you always have the mind um, of a scientist? Are you a mad scientist? How, 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 do, how do you go from being a clinical dentist uh, to uh, inventing something like this? At dental school, uh, where I studied in South Africa, you, there was an elective where in the final year you could choose which department you wanted to go and spend a certain amount of time in. I went to the Dental Research Institute at, at the University of Atlantis Run. That's the university where I graduated. And uh, there was a professor, Keaton Jones, there. And I, I admired him. He was a very special person on a personal level. And as a scientist, he was also excellent. And I enjoyed that two months that we spent together. We did a study and uh, I was taught and I very much appreciate his uh, input and that drove the love for dentistry. He offered me a job at the institute and at that time I remember thinking I was about to graduate. There's no chance that I'm going to go there, I'm graduating and I'm going to be a dentist. But about six months after practicing I thought I don't want to spend my whole life just doing dentistry, I'd like to go back. So I took the job and at the Dental Research Institute, and he encouraged me to carry on dentistry, so I spent at that time 20% of my time in clinical practice and the rest in research, and eventually I taught dental materials at that university in a different department, and then I, um, at that stage I was very involved in research, and I moved to Israel and did a PhD in biophysics using enamel as the, as the material that was studied. Um, that's, that's where I did the PhD. And basically the idea was to understand protein enamel relationships and, and th to understand dental tissue better in terms of being able to appreciate dental materials in a more sophisticated, at a more sophisticated level. That's basically the background to it. So but I always retained a dental practice and I practiced so you were born in South Africa. Where, where were you born? In Johannesburg. Um, who's the famous dentist we had on the show? I love him so much. Jeffrey Nathan. Howie. 
Is it How Howie Gluckman? Uh, I'm like 90% sure. One second. Do you, do you know him? I know of him. He he's, he does uh, implants. He's a periodontist, from what I understand. Right. I don't know him personally. I know of him. Oh my God! So, so my... what? So tell us about your journey. How? Yeah, Howard Gluckman, but he goes by yeah, Howie. Sure. Uh, I my mom's the only one that calls me Howie. No one else calls me Howie. They usually call me uh, Howard, or uh, a bunch of profanity. Uh, it's, uh, but Howard Gluckman. South Africa has a very robust dental community. Very robust dental schools. Howard Gluckman, and there's just a ton of really. Some of the world's most amazing dentists are in South Africa. Tell us about your journey. What made you leave um, Howard Gluckman and uh, the town of Johannesburg and end up in uh, Jerusalem? Tell us about your journey. Um, this professor, Clayton Jones, once told me that I should do an elective at uh, the Vitamin Institute because he knew of, of the, that institute. So I spent an elective for two months there, and I liked it very much, and I was invited to do a PhD there. And that's why I landed up doing a PhD there. But you, but you never went home, which makes me think that uh, usually they say in The Economist that the only time you lose, uh, leave your country, they say only 1% of the 7.5 billion humans on Earth uh, are living outside the country they were born in. It's only 1%. And they say they almost always leave for uh, only four reasons. Um, it was uh, economics, opportunity, love, or they were um, being abused at home, uh, the refugees, or they're running from the law. So which one was it? Was it economic opportunity? Did you meet a woman? Were you running from the law? Or, or were they uh, beating you up in South Africa? I, I think the answer would be opportunities. Opportunities. But you stayed. You didn't go back. So you must have found, you must have found love in Jerusalem. So you you love, maybe. You what? There you can include love. So I guess it's a combination of opportunities and love. So you went there for opportunity and then you fell in love? With, uh, <laughs> I, I, I fell in love with the land. I, when I arrived here, I was already married. My wife is also ex-South African. Oh, so you found love in South Africa, then you went there for opportunity. Um, but you and stayed. Love. By the way, I have to thank you so much because um, my mother turns 80 this summer. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that for HIPAA since she is my patient. Am I giving away personal information? But, um, I, you know, I've sent my mom uh, um, to Paris, London, um, Paris, London, Rome. I mean, she's the most Catholic woman on earth, and I even sent her to Rome. But nothing thrilled her more than when I sent her and her girlfriends all to uh, Jerusalem on some 10-day tourist bus deal i mean my gosh that was the highlight of her life i mean she just thinks that was the greatest trip and uh i should i should uh, uh send her back in fact i in fact we should go with her ryan uh, but i always tell her i said i would only go if i can make a business if i was lecturing there if you could just put me in, in a bar and have two dentists sit there so i can tell the uh, internal revenue service that it was a dental lecture, uh, then I then everything would be paid for uh, with uh, pre-tax money. But on a vacation, it's paid with 38% uh, uh, post-tax money. But but seriously, I mean, she just thinks that was the greatest time in her entire life. I mean, it was just it's a really well. I, I wonder if tourism is that make one of the top three sectors of uh, Israel's economy. I mean, is it a big, huge factor of the economy? It is a big factor. I'm not sure what percentage and where it rates. Uh, I guess Israel's known for startup companies. That's that's the, probably the biggest thing. Um, tourism is a big thing because there are a lot of places. And what's having lived here, what's amazing is there are other places that are not well known by tourists that are also fascinating. So if you come, I can introduce you to an excellent uh, a tour guide who can, if you have time, can take you to very, very interesting places. Well, um, email that to me, and uh, I'll, uh, uh, this, will, this will become a very, this will become a very expensive podcast for me. You know why? Because last time I said, I guess who was really jealous? Sister Anne. Yeah, Sister Anne of Yahweh, and uh, my other sister, and uh, I should probably just send the three of them. Uh, I would go with them, but I, I couldn't, because, uh, my God, they would be running around the city from like 6 a.m. 
to 10 p.m. seven days a week. And if I said, well, let's just sit in the bar and have some beers and watch some sports, uh, they would think I had completely lost my mind. I couldn't think of anything more exhausting than running around with my mom and two sisters uh, for 10 days. I'd probably, uh, I'd probably, if I, I'd probably find the only cliff on Jerusalem and jump off it. Would you say that dentistry is, uh, would you say that there's too many dentists in Israel? There's the right amount or there's not enough? I mean, some countries, like you go to Malaysia, forever they had one dental school. And then they opened up about six private dental schools. And it's really changed the economics of being a dentist. Um, so what do we have? They, uh, Ryan just found Israel has 7,500 practicing dentists and close to 300 new dentists joining the profession each year. Israel has one of the highest proportions of dentists to the general population in the world. Around 85% of all dentists in Israel work in private clinics or group practice. So there's 7,500, so you said 8 million. I should, you could probably do this in your head, but since I have a walnut brain, 8 million divided by 7,500 Wow, so you own, so you guys have a dentist for every 1,066 people. America has a dentist for every 1,850 people. And if you're listening to me now, remember that in the United States, half the people live in 147 metros. The other half live in 19,008 towns. And when you start going in downtown famous areas like Scottsdale and LA and Manhattan, you're down to about a dentist for every 500 people. And the average, so if you want, so if your location is just neutral in America, you'd want to be one dentist for every 1850. And I can show you rural places all day long where there's a, there's not even a dentist and there's six to 10,000 people living. And every dentist that goes there the first year will collect about a million two and take home $400,000 in cash. Um, demographics matter. So I would, have, I would have to say to you, Arun, that um, Israel is a very competitive market for a dentist with only 1,066 people per dentist. We've already talked for 42 minutes. Uh, what, what other questions did you want to talk about that I wasn't smart enough to ask you about? I think we've covered most of the important. I wrote a few notes down, and I think we've covered most of it. The only thing that you, I thought you might ask me was, um, how do you know focal works? I would. That was my next question. <laughs> that was my very next question. You took the words right out of my mouth, Ryan. The first of all, that fluoride is known to be effective. That's the first thing. The first study we did is once we developed the focal. I placed it on um, extracted orthodontic teeth and measured the infrared changes on the on these. What we did is we scraped the enamel off and subjected it to inf infrared studies. And there you can see changes that the hydroxyapatite had changed to fluoroapatite. So that was the first clue we knew that what we were making was working. After that, we did a little bit of a pilot study together with... Uh, Professor Davis at the University of London, where they use 3D micro radio, radiographic studies. And there we show that there are changes as well. So those were the sort of the stepping stones to say we knew we wanted a good thing. And then after that, the reason these weren't published because they were in-house. After that, uh, the, the, we allowed the uh, Indiana University to use the focals. And there, the results were much more positive and much more effective than I'd expected. That's basically the uh, proofs. Besides the clinical studies, which is not really science, they're sort of more empirical. You have a few dentists here and there showing um, results from uh, radiographs. So there could be other factors involved. It could be that you're missing stuff. You need many, many... Um, more subjects to be able to publish something sensible. But from my personal view, I think the vocals are effective and I, I think the key to it is the effectiveness is, is higher if you catch it earlier. What's, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit controversial now because what happens is at the initial stages you have a porous piece of enamel and, and you can get good fluoridation and you can change the situation. But if it's too late and you're only seeing it uh, radiographically, you're seeing a very old, for example, um, 
microscopically, it's, it's, a, it's much more advanced than we ever would imagine. So you're treating something that shouldn't really be subjected to fluoride because it already needs a restoration. Um, so the key to it is to find it at the earlier stage. Another problem is that what, what, what's happening is the when decay starts, the surface develops a strong remineralization zone, and that unfortunately acts as a barrier to further fluoridation. So you compromise. So the controversial thing that I'm thinking of is to actually file interproximally to remove that layer and then subject them to fluoridation like a focal. Now, I don't know what people are going to say about that, but that's pretty radical. What do you think? I, I agree. I mean, they, they, they taught us decades ago, 30 years ago, that the the cavity you see on the bite wing x-ray is only about 40 to 60 percent of the size of the lesion and you're right that is a demineralized dead zone and the active decay zone is not shown up on the radiograph yet it's also under is in other words there's a shield there's an, the remineralization that takes place naturally occurs on the surface and then the decay carries on internally so sometimes, even clinically, you can see an interproximal um, restoration that on the surface it looks okay. And then if you probe a little bit deeper, there is decay underneath. On the other hand, you can get situations which, which they call the fluoride bomb, where you've fluoridated so well that the enamel is completely fluoridated, but the decay in the dentine carries on. My idea with that is if you could do such things, it could involve we could sort of uh, treat interproximal decay with fluoridize, fluoridization and not have to go into the interproximal zone and just treat the dentine from the clusal area. But they, these are radical views and um, they need to be tested. So do you use Kerry's indicator? Because, you know, they always talk about the difference between affected dentin versus infected dentin. Infected dentin is the outer layer that is softened and contaminated with the bacteria. It is irreversibly denatured and not remineralized. Versus affected dentin has a demineralized phase but not yet invaded by bacteria. It can be remineralized. Some people think that these caries indicator stuff like, say, Seek by Ultradent, Dan Fisher, that it's staining affected dentin and you're removing too much dentin. Do you use a caries indicator yourself? I used to use it more. I don't use it so often anymore. Because, because of that? Because you thought it was staining affected dentin and you're removing a bunch of um, demineralized dentin that was not yet infected by bacteria, which could be remineralized? Is that why? Howard, I think, truth be told, I think it's more laziness and um, a lack of information. That's the truth. I, I, there was a stage that I was into it, and I used it much more than I hardly use it anymore. I have it, but I don't use it, and I'm not. I, I, I'm not sure if it's clinically um, worthwhile. I, does it change the prognosis of the treatment? I'm not sure. Okay, the other two huge controversies in um, DK is you still have people wondering um, if it's contagious. I, I don't know why people wonder if it's contagious. I mean, if you walked out in your backyard and you saw a giraffe, I mean, didn't that giraffe have to come from a mom and dad giraffe? I mean, it had to come from somewhere. It just didn't, it just didn't all of a sudden show up in your backyard. So how does some human all of a sudden have streptococcus mutans in the mouth? I think um, what I've noticed for 30 years, because we're, let's go back to that pediatric um, case. Every time some young two or three year old child is taken to the hospital and put under and doesn't recover from the anesthesia. You know, the press makes the dentist be out the bad guy. But like in my own backyard, when that happened uh, last time, everyone in the state knows that that pediatric dentist is one of the best. And he had a board certified anesthesiologist and they did everything right. And what the media doesn't talk about is that that little kid couldn't be treated by any of the general dentist. They refer to there, they couldn't do it. And then that, gen that pediatric dentist couldn't do it, so he needed to put on um, anesthesia. But what I'm asking is, why does a two-year-old or a three-year-old need multiple pulpotomies and chrome steel crowns? And what I've seen 
is it's in families. I mean, it's like the whole family has bombed out mouths or they don't. And I'm thinking that two-year-old kid is being kissed by her mother and father who have bombed out teeth that need teeth extracted. They got periodontal disease. You know, they're totally infected. And then that kid who does occasionally drink sugar and does things wrong a lot, they just don't seem to have the decay problem. I mean, why is it? And then, then the other side of that, um, which I think is going to change everything in 10 years, I've always noticed that you either have a lot of gum disease and perio with very little to no decay, or you have a bombed out decay and you don't have perio. I don't really see mouths that have 15 cavities with rampant gum disease, which makes me think there's something in the gut microbe that's, uh, that's affecting this. Because when you look in the mirror, you see one trillion human animal cells that you got from your mom and dad. But from the 30 foot tube from your mouth to your rectum is 10 trillion organisms, viruses, fungi, yeast that didn't come from mom and dad. And I think there's something going on in the gut microbiome that has effects at the end of that tube. Our end is the mouth, the proctologist end is the other end. But I think there's something going on in the microbiome because you just see, I've seen patients for 30 years that tell me, I've never flossed my teeth, I hardly ever brush, and they don't have any decay problems. And then I have hygienists that is patients of mine. I have one who cries at almost every appointment. She's my age because she gets her teeth cleaned every three months, she does everything right, and she still is losing teeth from periodontal disease. There's more to it than we know. So my two questions are, do you think dental decay is contagious and you shouldn't kiss her someone with a bunch of cavities and number two do you think the gut microbiome is affecting gum disease and dental decay in the mouth very interesting questions first of all there's a genetic factor as well that we have to take into consideration the second thing is i i have noticed in my personal practice that there's a high incidence of perio where the husband and the wife both have it um, I wouldn't say it's 100%, but it certainly sticks out. In terms of the decay, what I've also noticed with uh, larger families, the older kids have better teeth than the younger te kids. When we have a, a family of, say, six um, children, siblings, usually the older kids have better teeth than the younger ones. So that, that's a question in terms of, I doubt whether the parents are kissing the younger kids more than the older ones or did so. Um, I guess it's a combination of genetics and what you're saying. I think it, for sure there is something to do with the, with the microflora and it would be contagious. Well, you know, as far as you, you see this in married couples, I mean, I, I, to me that's been so obvious for 30 years. But think of the human body. If we turn the human body over and you were seeing dad every three months for chlamydia, and just every three months he still had chlamydia, wouldn't you say, hey, dude, I think you're sleeping with someone with chlamydia. And then you get his wife in there, you treat them both, and it's gone. I mean, I cannot believe how many dental offices have seen the wife every three months for 10 years, and they've never seen her husband one time. How can I treat your periodontal disease if every night you're going to bed and you're kissing grandpa, and he's got six millimeter bleeding pockets and gum disease. I mean, why does it make sense below the belt and it doesn't make any sense above the belt? It's almost like we have two medical philosophies for a human. One is below the belt and one's above the belt. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's insanely yeah, obvious. I, I agree with you. I, 100%. And, I, and I've been What's telling you, hey, I don't see it so much. The husband and wife, in terms of the amount of uh, caries, I'm not, I don't, from my clinic, limited clinical experience, I don't see such a correlation. But perio, for sure, I see a strong correlation. But do you see a correlation that if they have a lot of perio, they don't have a lot of decay? And if they have a lot of decay, yes. they don't have a lot of perio? Yes. Okay, and all, it makes my, sense. all my friends tell me that too, which makes me think, you know, like go to the jungle. Maybe if you have a lot of cheetahs, uh, you don't have a lot of deer. Maybe you have a, you know, I mean, to me, 
there's something going on. And I think just thinking about the very end of that 30-foot tube, and you think that's where all the answers are, I think when you start studying gut microbiome, your colon, I mean, just your colon probably has, I mean, you're, you're a trillion cells, your gut microbiome is 10 trillion. So, com, so your gut microbiome, 10 trillion, the largest zoo in America is the San Diego Zoo with 4,200 species. That 10 trillion gut microbiome has over 10,000 species. So you'd have to have two and a half San Diego zoos worth of species. Uh, so to me, I think the, um, um, I, I, I think when they eventually figure out that gut microbiome, I really think it's going to change how we treat and view um, gum disease and dental decay. I agree with you. But there are other factors. There, there's the, the amount of calcium in the saliva as well. Yeah. Where a person with a lot of calcium that forms a lot of um, tartar or calculus will have a bigger tendency towards uh, perio and less restorations because of the calcium, well, which is remineralizing. Well, is this true or false? If someone has a lot of decay and I touch the saliva and pull my finger out, it's ropey, the saliva sticks, and I can pull out, you know, two or three inches of ropey saliva from my finger to, to the saliva. But if it's periodontal disease, that's not the fact. Do you, do you agree that saliva is thick and ropey and stringy if they have full decay, but not periodontal disease? Yes, that's a known thing. I think that's the more viscous, the less. More yeah. viscous. That was the word I was looking for. That was the next word out of my mouth. More viscous. One of the biggest practice builders that I've had is, you know, I'll get a new patient and they moved in from, say, Iowa or Can. You know, in Phoenix, everybody's moving here uh, from the northern cold part. So they're, they're tired of living in Canada, Minnesota, North and South Dakota. And they always come down here and so many people move in. They say, well, you know, I always get my teeth in every three months because... You know, I, I got to stay on top of my periodontal disease and blah, 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 blah. And I say, okay, so how often uh, does your husband get his teeth clean? And she rolls her eye and says, my husband hasn't had his teeth clean in 10 years. And when you start comparing um, STDs to perio, her eyes get big and she gets them in there. It's a huge practice bill. It says, I can't treat you for periodontal disease or chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, or syphilis or whatever every three months without treating your lover too. So that immediately doubles your periodontal practice. Number two, when I see a girl showing, and you better put that on the health history because at least every five years I ask a girl when she's due and she tells me she's not pregnant and you can tell she wants to you know, just uh, shoot me in the head. But when a girl is pregnant from the health history or she's obvious and you tell her, look, now, you know that baby is not going to be born with syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HPV. Well, the mouth is the same thing. That baby is not going to be born with streptococcus mutans that causes decay, P. gingivalis that causes gum disease, HPV that causes oral cancer. They're not going to be born with cold sores and canker sores. They're not going to get any of these herd diseases until people start kissing them and licking them and sharing utensils with them. And what I want you to do is promise me that no ba nobody's going to kiss that baby on the mouth. And it's called loading dose. Like, say, the number one killer on earth is um, um, cholera. We know you have to drink 100,000 cholera bacteria for enough to survive the acid and the pH of the stomach to actually set up an infection in the small intestine and cause the cholera and the diarrhea. It's the same thing with humans. I tell that pregnant mother, I need everybody that's going to hold, kiss, everybody that's going to be around that baby, your babysitter, your grandmas and grandpas. You can't hand your newborn baby to your grandmother who's got an upper denture, a lower partial, and a bunch of gum disease and have her kiss that baby on the mouth. You need to start instructing everybody, um, kiss the baby on the head, kiss it on the back of the hand. Kiss. I, I use, what I do is I... Uh, uh, I used to kiss my um, grandbabies and grandkids uh, on the bottom of the foot. Hell, it makes them laugh, giggle, scream, kick. I mean, you just don't kiss a baby on the mouth. And I need to get everybody 
who's going to be around that baby, I need to get them a new patient exam, cleaning, exam, x-rays. If they got gum disease and bombed out trees, let's fix it so they have less of a chance. Some people are walking around with hundreds of millions of, of structural constituents, hands, and peaches, and valves, and just a nickel's worth of saliva. Let's try to get that to go away. And the only country that I've seen, I've only seen two countries who really are on top of it, and that is Liechtenstein and Austria, and to somewhat the Germans. And how I can prove that is Ivoclair, Williams Ivoclair, which is out of Liechtenstein, they sell like Streptococcus mutans, testers, incubators, the whole nine yards. They don't even advertise it in any country around the world because the only people that have ever shown interest to it is in Liechtenstein and Austria and a few Germans. And I have lectured in 50 countries, and you ask a pediatric dentist, well, how's your practice? He'll say, it was good. I had three hygienists. I work two chairs, and I go into the hospital once a week. <clears throat> you have that same conversation with a pediatric dentist in Liechtenstein. He'll say, well, you know, I'm doing really good. I have 1,800 patients, and 900 of them still don't even test positive to streptococcus mutans. So, you know, life is a marathon. There's people that finish the marathon in uh, three hours and one minute. And then there's me, who's at the back of the line, finishing in uh, six and a half hours, looking for a donut stand. But I think the front of the race on preventing the transmission of these oral diseases that Homo sapien is not born with is in Liechtenstein, it's in Austria, and the whole and everybody listening to this podcast could start really consulting the pregnant mother that says, hey, your baby doesn't need to be inoculated with streptococcus mutans and periodontal disease any more than it needs to be inoculated with HPV. And let's start, um, I think the best dentistry ever done is no dentistry at all. I don't want my grandchildren to have the finest gold restorations like grandpa. Grandpa only has seven restorations. They're all gold cemented with zinc phosphate cement those are the best i don't want my grandchildren to when they're 55 to have seven gold inlays onlays and and crowns um so the best doctors prevent disease the worst doctors just drill fill and bill and don't ever um prevent disease so be a preventative dentist don't be a drill fill and bill on the assembly line um arun joe they can it was an honor that you accepted my invitation to come on the show. Remember, there's no commercials. You're such a scientist. Are you a mad scientist or just a normal scientist? I hope just a normal one. <laughs> and I, we, thank we, you very much for your input. I enjoyed listening to your ideas. I, and it's 11.16 a.m. in Phoenix. What time is it on in uh, Jerusalem right now? It's now 8.16 on the on. That's what I have recorded on the internet. 8.16 8, 8, p.m. Well, thank you for staying up uh, late at night to talk <laughs> to my homies. Uh, you were amazing. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. And if you ever come to Jerusalem, I'd be pleased to meet you. Oh, well, we're coming. I'm going to bring my mom and my sisters. Well, you don't want to meet my mom. She'll talk your ear off.